Hi, and welcome to our webinar, The Bad, Enterprise AI Roadblocks. This is the third of our four episode series on enterprise AI research and the remaining episode, The Ugly, is coming up soon. You can register for it using the links that are in the attachments panel uh, on your webinar console. Uh, you can also, along the way, submit any questions you have for myself or my uh, partner and colleague in crime here, uh, Jonna Till Johnson. Um, I'm CTO at Nemertes, and Jonna is the CEO. And uh, we welcome your questions. If you pop them in during the course of the session, we'll try and answer them as, as uh, quickly as we can after they appear. Uh, otherwise, we'll bunch them up and answer them at the end of the session. And uh, let me see, if you are not familiar with us, Nemertes is a research and strategic advisory firm, and we are focused on uh, identifying best practices and ways in which organizations can realize the value, the business value that can come from deploying emerging technologies. And you can see the areas in which we're focusing our research there. Uh, we're very excited, especially about the ones that we've uh, added most recently, quantum technologies, enterprise AI. Uh, and uh, as you'll see, our enterprise AI research is off and running. So uh, about the study, we conducted a study with enterprise IT professionals uh, during the spring of this year and in the summer did our analysis. We had a total of 28 participants from uh, over eight industries. Uh, seven of the participants were from financial services firms and <clears throat> uh, the median employee count was a little over 23,000 people and the median annual revenue was just under $8 billion. So if you remember your high school math, um, that means roughly half the companies are above those sizes and half the companies are below those sizes. Through the course of the research findings that we're going to be discussing in this session, we will be uh, showing you both the overall results for the particular uh, questions that we asked related to organizations' use of uh, AI, uh, but we'll also be doing cuts of the data based on a, a few different uh, differentiators. Uh, the first being IT culture. Uh, we look at an organization's overall approach to IT as being a very important distinguishing factor. Folks who look at IT as uh, only a means of trying to control costs or save money or comply with some regulatory requirement, uh, those folks tend to be more conservative in their approach to IT and they do things very differently with respect to emerging technologies especially than folks who look at IT as strategic and are uh, typically trying to stay uh, abreast of or even get ahead of their competition by deploying emerging technologies quickly. Uh, we'll also be looking at the differences between the smaller companies and the larger ones uh, as determined by annual revenues. And uh, new in this research study and of a great deal of interest to us, the differences between the extremely productive companies, the ones who have uh, revenues in excess of a million dollars per employee and all the rest of the companies. Um, and especially when you've got a technology that uh, like enterprise AI is uh, meant to try and make folks more efficient in their execution of their duties. Um, it's interesting to look at the con <laughs> Excuse and me. Oh, bless sorry. you. I had that too. <laughs> um, I, and with that, I will hand over to Jonna. If only I had done so before I sneezed. Yes, and, and John has to uh, sneeze a bit, so I'll pick it up from here. So the ugly here, uh, the bad is the, sorry, the ugly comes next. Bad is the roadblocks and concerns. So the first thing you're probably thinking as you're looking at this is, so what's the difference between a roadblock and a concern, or are, are they all the same thing? Uh, we differentiated between them because as we conducted the interviews, we wanted to sort of tease out the difference between why are you not deploying AI more aggressively today at a practical level? And what are your sentiments about AI? So really the roadblock is a practical obstacle and the sentiment is uh, you know, how you feel about it. So we did spend a lot of time on this particular study asking participants their thoughts because we interview pretty senior level executives at pretty big companies as, as John pointed out. And it's very useful to know what they're thinking and feeling as well as what's going on by the numbers. 
So what are they thinking and feeling? Uh, well, some of the issues are things like copyright and bias protecting IP. Uh, a big roadblock for many is the infancy of technology, uh, which is literally the tools are very young, emerging very quickly, and sometimes the implications of them are not super well known. Uh, data. Do we have all the data? How are we storing the data? Should it be in a data lake? Should it be in a database? How do we track it? How do we manage it? It's really about data engineering, not data quality, which data quality is also a concern, but that tends to fall into other areas. Um, standardization of, uh, of the models, what are acceptable use cases, defining those models, uh, and again, getting that, you know, data pops up again with both data engineering and data quality with the challenge of la minimizing bias. Uh, so scalability and data management is really that big orange thing. And of course, data privacy keeps popping up. And you'll see that again, you know, privacy, intellectual property, and bias tend to show up as both roadblocks and concerns, which is probably good. So here you have the quantitative uh, stack them up, uh, and this is overall, not with any specific cuts. We'll see those in just a second. Um, the Top one is a lack of effective privacy. In other words, we can't keep our private stuff private. Uh, second one is we don't know how to do this. If you're an IT professional watching this, that is a flag saying plant this flag in the ground. This is where you can add value to the organization is help them figure this out and accelerate their use cases and accelerate, uh, accelerate their use of AI as a service. A lack of appropriate institutional guardrails. We'll talk about that and then Getting back to we can't really protect our data pops up again, technology and maturity and then everything else. So if you look at, and this is comparing the highly aggressive organizations with all others, they are more likely, and this is fascinating, they are more likely to say lack of knowledge is holding them back. Now keep in mind that the definition of a highly aggressive company is a company for whom uh, technology is considered a strategic differentiator. What's very funny in AI is that these are the companies that were caught flat-footed by the advent of, of uh, generative AI and LLMs. It's very interesting to see that. And I think the reason for that, and I can certainly plead guilty to this, is John and I have been studying AI for more decades than you want to know. Um, I think we've been studying long enough for people to become grandparents. And AI has always been on the horizon, on the horizon, you know, used within particular products, kind of a, a it was more, I don't want to say it's a coding technique, but effectively that was the level it was. And then last year, thank you very much, ChatGPT, or early this year, blew ChatGPT into prominence and all of a sudden your average rank and file suddenly discovered it. So Aggressive organizations were probably doing the same thing we did. They'd been keeping tabs on it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They didn't actually anticipate that 2023 would be the year it popped up, and now they're, like, struggling. Um, interestingly enough, more conservative companies, it's kind of the same. Really, this is interesting because conservative companies are the ones that have guardrails and roadblocks or guardrails and institutional guidance for using technology, and yet they're worried about the lack of it here. So it's kind of counterintuitive, and that's the fun of AI. Uh, if you then look at the uh, larger companies, interestingly enough, they're more concerned about, um, th they are a lot more concerned about the institutional guardrails. There's a reason for that, there is a pretty high overlap between financial firms and large firms. And they are also much more concerned about data protection uh, and privacy. Uh, and that all makes sense because large companies tend to have had those, concern those concerns drummed into them and therefore they perceive them as roadblocks. Last but not least, if you look at where the highly productive companies are have, have uh, roadblocks. It's not having the guardrails. It's lack of knowledge and lack of effective privacy. Um, and that's actually quite interesting as well. So, John, what have we found with roadblocks? Oh, that overall, the top roadblocks to actually rolling out AI in production or to rolling it out further or faster, so things that are really uh, getting in the way, uh, are inadequate provisions for protecting privacy. And understand that that's both uh, privacy and intellectual property. We, we split the two apart because although they're significant overlap, you're not protecting the data. Um, they are separate concerns. You're not protecting the privacy of our customers, our clients. Uh, if somebody asked the chat bot the wrong question, will they get 
data they're not supposed to see. And you're not protecting our intellectual property enough. If somebody asks the chatbot the wrong questions, uh, will they understand uh, our stock picking algorithms in ways that they're not supposed to? So uh, concerns around those things, uh, lack of institutional governance and guardrails tied right up with lack of knowledge about how to effectively apply the technology. So going to that uh, institutional capability to actually take advantage of the technology. And so uh, we look at organizations as engaging with AI in ways that are similar to their previous engagement of other technologies like the internet when it was introduced, like mobility uh, and the roadblocks kind of flow out of that earlier uh, embrace or failure to embrace technologies. We don't understand how to implement, manage, or control it or how to get value from it. So we're not going to go there yet. Uh, and honestly, organizations are right to treat this as something with a similarly radical transformative potential. Um, but that should be getting them to really, you know, dig their heels in and move, you know, jump forward, not dig their heels in as in dragging their heels to slow everything down. So uh, as distinct from roadblocks, we did ask folks about their concerns about AI. So uh, even if they're pressing ahead with this, even if their, their staff are using AI in different ways or they are at a corporate level, uh, uh, making it part of the strategic technological direction, um, that doesn't mean that all of their address, uh, concerns have been addressed. And so, uh, you know, we see up in that upper left cor corner, the, the sorcerer's apprentice problem, the idea that we'll be able to do things, uh, damaging things much more quickly than we could before. Uh, and we'll have legal, ethical privacy concerns that we didn't have when we were just talking about scripts to manage the network for us. And um, there's sort of a public trust issue involved. Uh, folks worried about getting out too far ahead of what their customers or clients are doing. Um, and uh, the idea that uh, we're pushing ahead faster than the social governance framework, uh, laws and regulations can keep up. Uh, the idea that data accuracy issues are gonna make it hard to trust the data. And we see that uh, continuing to uh, be um, manifest in you know the, the public stories that we see about AI, uh, people putting together those the legal brief and finding out that half the citations in it are fake, it, it's a problem and it does make it hard to trust uh, what comes out of the AI in the end. And uh, the idea that it's still dependent on people to correct it uh, and that it's um, not gonna be doing things better than us necessarily, at least not for a while yet, and so instead, we're going to be doing things that um, are, are better than what we can do with AI and AI we're going to need to bring along for the ride. So overall, uh, as I said, top concern, privacy. Uh, privacy of uh, customer data, privacy of client data. And uh, related to that, uh, the security of the systems involved and whether data that's supposed to be confidential can be uh, stolen basically using the AI as a conduit. Uh, folks are worried about poor data quality and bias in the data, as well as bias in the algorithms that have been trained on the data. So some huge concerns about AI that are kind of across the board for verticals, across the board for types of companies. But when you start to dig in, you'll see that uh, the aggressive companies are more likely to be concerned about things like scalability, more likely to be concerned about things like uh, opacity, the lack of transparency in the AI itself. And they really like to understand how the tools they're using work. So they, they are uh, not moving as aggressively uh, as they normally would. Uh, where you see the more conservative companies more worried, significantly more worried about uh, data being stolen, about poor data quality. And uh, it's interesting then tracking that through to the large companies and seeing that the large companies uh, are significantly more likely, inverting the previous one, to be more concerned about data exfiltration, to be more concerned about poor data quality uh, than the smaller companies. Uh, they're even more likely to be concerned about privacy, but less likely to be concerned about bias, which is kind of a, an outlier here. 
So we'll see that uh, more productive companies, uh, again, tend to be less concerned about some of the big bread and butter issues like uh, security and data quality, but more concerned about things like regulatory inadequacies and lack of model transparencies. Uh, these folks are very attuned to using automations to uh, help them be so productive, uh, so much more productive than their, their uh, peers, uh, and not being able to see what's going on under the hood uh, and not being sure if it's going to be keeping them uh, within the bounds of the law. Those are both things that are highly concerning to them, uh, more so than uh, to other folks. Uh, and so, John, back over to you. I, I will take it away. I'm not going to go ahead and read the top bullet items. I'm really just going to focus on the takeaway here because... What we're really seeing is that AI serves as a bit of a Rorschach test for organizations. And what I mean by that is all of us bring to the unknown uh, our experience with the formerly unknown, now known. So, for example, um, aggressive and productive organizations tend to worry more about the sorcerer's apprentice because those are the kinds of companies that have, through their aggressive use of technology and their focus, as John said, on automation, they've run into this. So they, if they haven't already had a Sorcerer's Apprentice issue, they've come very, very close. So they're, wor they're justifiably worried about it. Meanwhile, um, larger organizations are worried about having to lay off employees. This is something they that we'll talk about in the next episode of the series uh, and other, other areas like that. So in other words, AI causes organizations to worry about the worst experiences they've had because they look at this and say, we've gone through a bunch of technology transformations in the, you know, in the past several years and decades. We know what can go wrong. And gosh, all of them seem to apply to AI. And they're not wrong. Uh, you know, we have a note that they're failing to face up to the transformative potential. Honestly, I don't think anybody's really failing to face up to it. I think the, the the big issue is when we ask them about their concerns, this is what they told us. So alongside the possibility for transformation are these concerns. Uh, I think this is super justified because several years ago, one of my leading edge clients asked me, Jonna, what are other companies doing around the area of digital ethics? So my response was, well, what do you mean by digital ethics? And together we hammered out this definition that di digital ethics is a set of policies and associated processes to manage the use of AI within an organization, but not just AI, but certainly in this application, AI. And that includes everything from privacy protection to bias to general ethical behavior. What digital ethics really means is sitting down and hammering out what is not just what is and isn't permitted, which is what everyone wants to jump to. Oh, we're banning chat GPT. Therefore, we have digital ethics. No, no, no. You got to decide what are employees allowed to do? What are employees not allowed to do? What uh, what information can be gathered and cannot be gathered? What information can be released and cannot be released? In fact, what is ethical behavior? And then following from that, once you actually know what ethical behavior is, you have the fun of putting the control points in your organization to ensure that people follow the ethical behavior. One of the things that's leaped out to us in doing this study is unlike other technologies for which IT has complete control, server virtualization, for example, once you figure out what the policies are, you hand it over to IT and go make it so. And more or less, IT makes it so. Uh, or if it's a cybersecurity issue, hey, cybersecurity, you know, make it so. They make it so. With AI, it's being deployed across the organization, often without cybersecurity, IT, or anyone else being told about it. So how do you put in place the mechanisms for those control points? How do you how do you ensure that employees internalize and live up to the digital ethics policy after you finish defining it? Those these are not easy questions. And if you're watch if you've been following along thus far, this is probably something you want to spend time and energy on because as you'll see in a second, nobody's got this right. So uh, just about a third of companies say they have digital ethics, to be honest. We're kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt because when we asked them what those di digital ethics policies were, we found out that generally they were not sufficiently comprehensive, may not have included a whole discussion of control, or were deficient in some other fashion. But nonetheless, they said they had them, so we gave them, a, you know, we gave them the blue slice. 
Everybody else doesn't have them yet. Um, and in fact, uh, as you can see, if you look at, for example, aggressive companies, those folks are less likely to have them. Conservative companies, half of them say they have them. And in fairness, I would tend to agree that they're probably telling the truth on this because conservative companies tend to be in more highly regulated industries. Uh, if you look at larger companies, you'll see that very large companies are much more likely to have digital ethics policies today than smaller companies. Again, no surprise. The bigger you are, the more likely you have a policy for anything and everything, right? Um, for the color of the shades on the window or what have you. Um, but still, you're still running it under half. And that's kind of the main point. Here, uh, highly productive companies, fully half of them say that they have a digital ethics policy. Again, I would argue that in many cases, these policies are actually highly deficient. Uh, they're just sort of the bare minimum because that's what highly productive companies tend to get along with is the bare minimum. Um, but not, nevertheless, there you have it. Speaking about banning chat GPT, the, a big question at the start of the, of the summer was, oh, everybody's past the hype cycle on, on chat GPT and everybody's going to ban it. Uh, no, they aren't. <laughs> so um, just 25% per of, or percent of organizations said they were planning to do it. Uh, another 18% said they hadn't decided, but the majority said they weren't. And if you look at this, um, conservative companies are more likely, uh, aggressive companies are much more likely to say, no, of course, we're not going to ban it. Uh, again, large companies are more likely to say no. Um, and uh, productive companies are actually... Uh, a little bit less likely to say yes, a little bit less likely to say no, and a lot more likely to say we're not sure yet because we haven't gotten around to looking at it because we are very disciplined with how we use our time. And that has that is not a question we have allowed ourselves to consider yet. I would say in general and kind of wrapping up with the key findings, uh, you probably don't have a, a good enough digital ethics program because only a third of organizations have one today and most of them are missing key pieces. Um, so in putting one together, uh, don't just assume that because you're following whatever guidelines your industry may have issued, which are pretty few, uh, or you're partnered with the right organization in your industry or blah, 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 you know, don't assume that any of that is going to get you where you need to be. You want to sit down and, and ask yourselves and senior executives, like, literally reach out to the head of legal, reach out to the head of risk, reach out to the head of compliance, say, guys, gals, who are we and what do we want to be when we grow up and what is our policy? What do we consider protected? What do we consider private? What cannot be released into the wild? What is shouldn't be released into the wild, but we're not going to, you know, have to tell our shareholders if it happens. And, you know, you'll find that a lot of this work has been done in the context of, say, cybersecurity. You might just have to revise it a bit and then also ask questions like, um, how are what how are we protecting against bias and how is that getting enforced? Because, again, you'll see that the biggest use of AI is within the lines of business, outside of the control of IT, outside of the control of cybersecurity. So it's a very interesting question how you enforce all of this. So with that, John, I believe I can hand over to you for the wrap up. Do we have any questions, by the way? Uh, let's give folks a chance, last chance, to get some questions in while I okay. walk to the boilerplate. Sounds um, good. If you are uh, an enterprise IT professional, we would love to have you join our private online community that is specifically for enterprise technology professionals. Uh, there's a short application form to fill out on the website. There's the link right there on the screen. And uh, if you note on it that uh, you uh, heard about the community from the Bright Talk webinar, uh, that'll help us keep track of uh, how folks come to uh, know us and love us. Um, if you are keeping up on the series here, you can, in the attachments tab, register for the upcoming and final episode in the series, The Ugly, Will Enterprise AI Steal Your Job? You can also uh, go to the Bright Talk channel and see the previous episodes in this series, uh, Enterprise AI Maturity, that was episode one, and episode two, Enterprise AI Benefits and Use Cases. And uh, with that, last chance for questions, folks. None, none have come in, so I think we can just thank everybody, and hopefully you learned something on this one. Hopefully. Uh, the replay should be up in the channel shortly. If you found it valuable, please 
share it with your colleagues uh, and take a moment to rate the webinar. That also helps us uh, guide how we develop the next uh, set of webinars. And Thank if you, you hated it, give us give us five stars anyway, but tell us what we need to change. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Five stars. But I hated it. Uh, we, we go with that, too. That works well. Uh, anyway, thanks, everybody, for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you on The Ugly uh, when it comes up. Goodbye, all. <laughs>